Thank you. It is my great honor to introduce our second keynote speaker, Maureen O'Connell. Maureen is a scholar who works at the intersection of political theology and Christian ethics. At LaSalle University in Philadelphia, she helps her students and colleagues think faithfully about how we ought to engage in social crises such as urban poverty and racism. After eight years of teaching theology at Fordham University, Maureen returned to her native city of Philadelphia in 2013 to chair the Department of Religion at LaSalle, where she is also an associate professor of Christian ethics. She holds a BA in history from St. Joseph University and a, PH and a PhD in theological ethics from Boston College. Maureen is the author of several books, including Compassion, Loving Our Neighbor in an Age of Globalization, and If These, Wo if These Walls Could Talk, Community Muralism and the Beauty of Justice. If These Walls Could Talk won the College Theology Book of the Year Award in 2012, as well as a first prize award from the Catholic Press Association in 2012. Her other publications include she Who Imagines Contemporary Feminist Aesthetics and many journal articles. Maureen's current research focuses on racial identity formation and racial justice in Catholic institutions of higher education. She serves on the board of the Society for Arts in Religious and Theological Studies and is a member of the St. Vincent de Paul Parish in Germantown neighborhood in Philadelphia. She is also a member of POWER, an interfaith federation of 90 faith communities committed to making Philadelphia a city of just love. Through fair wages for workers, funding for public schools, immigration reform, and decarceration. Please join me in welcoming Maureen. morning. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you, to be back with the family, to still be considered part of the family, even though I'm playing with a different franchise these days, the Christian Brothers. Oh. <laughs> I'm grateful for my history with three Ignatian communities in this room, in particular St. Joseph's University, Boston College, and Fordham University who have given me tools, and perhaps more importantly, the courage to take up the calling of my vocation as a theologian every day. For about 10 years now, ever since I started making pilgrimages around Philadelphia looking for God in community murals and the people who make them, walking through neighborhoods in North Philadelphia where my great-grandparents and grandparents lived, and sensing my connection to the transformation of ghettos of opportunity into ghettos of last resort, and longing to have even an iota of the creativity and resilience of folks who make these beautiful murals, I have discerned the spirit calling me to wade into the troubled waters of racial injustice. I have felt called to understand my family, my church, my vocation, what's going on in my neighborhood, the city through the lens of race. It's not been pretty. It's not been easy. The way has not been clear. People of color used to white splaining, where racism is, racism is concerned, are understandably suspicious. There's not much they haven't heard where good intentioned white folks are concerned. And even tough an even tougher crowd are my fellow whites, colleagues, students, parishioners, family members, who aren't always receptive. To use the words of state rep from Pennsylvania, Brian Sims, for folks who are accustomed to privilege, equality starts to feel like oppression. And just about every day I realize how much I don't know and don't understand about racism. If white folks are afraid to talk about racism, and trust me, we are, 
then imagine how terrified I am to talk about it with an intimate gathering of 1,500, 1,500 family members, no less. The waters are deep and troubled. The temptation to stay on the shore is real, never mind to talk about bridges. But then I think of my students in religion and racism in America this semester, half of whom are students of color, half of whom are white, trying to understand each other across a chasm of racial segregation that is now 20 generations old in the United States and that affords them little, if any, meaningful access to each other's experiences. And I know we've got so much work to do. Not out there, but right here in our own family. Just last Wednesday, a class discussion sparked by the violent arrest of a black female student in a school in Columbus, South Carolina, revealed just how much we are all held captive by racism, to borrow an idea from Joseph Barnt, a white pastor with the anti-racist Crossroads Ministry. Four white education majors in the midst of a demanding student teaching schedule shared their frustration at the disrespect they received from students and even parents in Philadelphia public schools, the majority of which are populated by African Americans, and how that disrespect makes them question their blossoming vocations as teachers. Black students in the classroom, all graduates of Philly public schools, shed light on the fact that it's hard to show respect when you're constantly disrespected by subpar facilities, not to mention how hard it is to manage the stresses that come with not having enough at home. In that moment, the group took the risk to name the gap and the different ways we experienced it, and it felt like we were drowning. So my students, and a timely reflection yesterday by Kevin O'Brien in Mission and Ministry at Georgetown and Give Us This Day, Kevin, I don't know if you're here, and Brendan Underwood in his comments with us last night, and Jane Barry in her comments with us this morning, remind us all of the call to holy boldness that we all receive as followers of Jesus. And so I ask, if not now, when? If not me, then who? If not here, then where? I know we need bridges. I suspect you know we need bridges. But we've got to be intentional with how we go about building them and maybe our, adjust our sense of where we need to start. And that's what I want to talk about with you this morning. I want to talk about racism right here in the Ignatian family something that creates dysfunction in any predominantly white family, even in the families taking up the call of social responsibility, taking up the call of holy boldness. And then I want to talk about how we might diagnose what's going on and lead you with some, some homework to do in your own institutions. So let's talk about being captives of racism and how we're all in this together. In preparation for the world meeting of families in Philly just six, six weeks ago, the PICO Network, a cousin of the Ignatian, Solid, Ignatian family, worked diligently with their affiliates around the country to lift up the economic challenges facing American families. Given that families of color disproportionately struggle in our economy of exclusion in the U.S., the PICO Network dared American Christians, especially American Catholics and specifically Pope Francis, to name racism as a root cause of the problems facing our families in the U.S. In fact, PICO sent an interfaith delegation to Rome in early June to meet with some of the Pope's closest advisors to make a personal appeal that the Pope, a Euro-American himself, not miss the opportunity to break the silence among people of European descent in the U.S. about the social sin of racism. 
a member of that delegation, the executive director of Power, which is PICO's affiliate in Philadelphia, who stands in the rich prophetic tradition of the black church in the U.S. said, we want to push out the black Protestant voice, the immigrant family voice, the voice closest to the pain of police brutality and racial injustice to make the point that you can't talk about strengthening families in America, poverty, or any other issue in this nation without talking about race. My dear brothers and sisters in the Ignatian family, I don't think it's a stretch to say that Bishop Royster is talking to us. We cannot do our social justice work without talking about race. Certainly, we must start with a racial gap that is giant and in plain sight. Just consider a few basic facts. White Americans constitute 64% of the population but hold 88% of the nation's wealth. And the income gap between whites and people of color has tripled since 1984. When it comes to housing, affluent people of color live in poorer neighborhoods than working class whites. And people of color are more likely than whites to be targeted by subprime lenders and less likely to see, receive conventional mortgages. Educational markers are also dismal when we consider that 74% 74, 74 of African American children and 80% of Hispanic children attend segregated schools. And African American preschoolers are more likely to be disciplined through suspension than white preschool children. Whites use drugs with greater frequency but blacks are three times as likely to be arrested for drug use, and the duration of sentencing for blacks is nearly 20 times that of whites. One in three black men will be incarcerated at some point in their lives, and this last point is unique to our, U our economic context in the U.S., where corporations make $50 billion a year locking people up. But I ask you, is being able to recite disturbing statistics enough? We need only to tweak our beautiful and inclusive teach-in roll call ritual with an eye for the cities that have become epicenters of racial tension to realize our proximity as an Ignatian family to the profound suffering of the racial gap in our own neighborhoods. What if St. Louis High School St. Louis University High School, following the leadership of Brendan Underwood, became Michael Brown and the community of Ferguson in our roll call? What if Regis Prep in New York City became Eric Gardner and the people of Staten Island, and Fordham University, Akai Gurley, and the people of Brooklyn? What if the University of Detroit Mercy would shout Presente for Renisha McBride and women of color in Detroit? Or if John Carroll were to jump to their feet for Tamir Rice and communities of Cleveland? Loyola, Maryland could claim Freddie Gray and Baltimore. Straight, straight, excuse me, straight Jesuit in Houston would stand for Sandra Bland and the folks of Waller, Texas. We must accept, fellow members of the Ignatian community, that racism is killing too many of our brothers and sisters of color, our neighbors right here in the U.S. And in failing to stand in solidarity with these folks, racism is strangling the Ignatian family too by cutting off, in Joe Fegan's estimation, our capabilities for empathy which is the most basic of the emotions needed for life and community, needed for solidarity. What if we were to remember the names of the martyrs of racism in the U.S. in the same way we remember the martyrs of November 16th? I cannot help but notice that on June 18th of this year, the day that the Pope released his beautiful encyclical on the environment, a document that tells us that the cries of the earth and the cries of the poor are the same cry, that on that day nine people were murdered in a church in Charleston in the name of the same forces of Euro-American dominance that slaughtered thousands in Latin America.
Dare we call Mother Emmanuel a base community, much like those in Latin America, given their long history of resisting the powers of Euro-American capitalism, their commitment to hearing and doing the word of God, or given the fact that their pastor was also a leader working to address systematic injustice? Do we have the courage to allow the blood of the martyrs of Mother Emmanuel to water the seeds of solidarity for people of color in our own communities, in fact, in our own schools and universities and ministries, seeds that we have not either, either have not planted or perhaps have not tended to? Dare we remember and acknowledge the presence in this room with us today Reverend Clementa Pinckney, Presente. Cynthia Hurd, Presente. Sharonda Coleman Singleton. Tawanza Sanders. Myra Thompson. Ethel Lee Lance. Susie Jackson. Daniel Simmons, DePayne Middleton Doctor. Fellow members of the Ignatian family, in the presence of all of these martyrs, we have to ask ourselves some tough questions. Why is it that most Catholics were not able to see a tragic link between the Charleston Nine and the central theme of Laudato Si about the cries of the poor and the cries of the earth. Scholars of color in our own family regularly point that link out for us. Here I'm thinking of womanist theologian M. Sean Copeland from Boston College who says that what happens to the earth and to people of color in an economy of exclusion fueled by white dominance are the same thing. We have to ask ourselves why we don't see an immediate connection between the martyrs of El Salvador and the martyrs of black liberation movements in the US, between the victims of US-sponsored civil wars in Central America and the violence of state-sanctioned poverty in the US that disproportionately affect people of color and are waged in the name of protecting white interests and power. Between the justice work that needs to be done in the world and the work that needs to be done within the institutions that make up this beautiful and yet predominantly white Ignatian family. Many members of the Ignatian family at universities around the country, most notably Father Brian Massingale of Marquette University, have suggested in order to make these connections, we need to turn and face a culture of racism in our family, to face what he calls the soul sickness of racism. This culture helped to create the racial inequality gap when Europeans first arrived in the Americas more than five centuries ago. It sorted people into arbitrary hierarchies of humanness based on physical attributes it assigned those, those bodies worth and then kept them from organizing around common interests through laws, social mores, and vigilanteism. This culture continues to dig a deep chasm in our collective American and Catholic psyche, and it grows the distance between those who are able to flourish and those who struggle to make ends meet. This is the chasm that my students and I fell into last week. I'm not talking here about interpersonal acts of hate or violence rooted in racial bias. Cultural racism might not explicitly endorse the acts of violence against black bodies we see on our Facebook pages and Twitter feeds on a seemingly daily basis. But when we understand racism as culture, Racism implicitly endorses this violence by justifying it as the acts of a few bad apples or madmen from whom the good apples can distance ourselves 
rather than see those madmen as individual manifestations of our collective values. It implicitly, endorse, it implicitly endorses this violence by suggesting that those on the receiving end must have deserved it, therefore making violence a reasonable form of retributive justice even to the point of death. A culture of racism simply accepts the structural violence of poverty as normal or as given or as unavoidable, making standing by far more reasonable than standing up. A culture of racism implicitly endorses acts of violence against black bodies when it fails to see that the social expectation that white bodies are to be protected at all costs demands the use of excessive force against black or brown bodies. Massingale says this, a focus on individual behaviors and attitudes does not adequately explain the existence of a racialized society where race is a principal lens for understanding social interpretations and ways of being. Racism, he says, is a cultural phenomenon. That is, it is a way of interpreting social color differences that pervades the collective convictions, conventions, and practices of American life. Racism, therefore, my brothers and sisters, is not out there. It's right here. It is among us. Dare we name it? Massingale tells us that for folks of color, our culture of racism is co a commonly shared experience of struggle in the face of prejudice, discrimination, rejection, and hostility. I've learned from my students of color in my courses and it's important to note that I'm not speaking for them here, I'm just lifting up what they have shared in their journals, in their reflection papers, in class discussions, and in advising sessions. For students of color, racism is their underrepresentation in our institutions, or not seeing themselves in the faces and experiences of their teachers and professors. A culture of racism is scrolling through their peers' racist yaks on yik yak and finding no rebuttals, or being targets of racial hate in their residence halls or at off-campus parties. A culture of racism is being made into tokens in our predominantly white classrooms with our predominantly white curriculums. It's being siloed into clubs and fraternities that don't receive the same institutional support it's having their membership in our predominantly white university communities called into question by campus security. A culture of racism is carrying the burden of being hyper-visible exceptions to the norm, and yet invisible when it comes to others expressing an interest in their lives and in their stories. A culture of racism is the moment their ideas are only taken seriously if they are made or echoed by a white person or having to spend more time than you should having to explain why all lives don't matter if black lives don't matter. It's facing insta <laughs> It's facing, a culture of racism is facing institutional inertia when trying to call these things to the attention of whites and white apathy when you cry out against the far worse injustices that many people who look like you face every day. For people of color in our family, a culture of racism is navigating all of these things and then the never-ending work of building bridges to close what Tinaheshi Coates calls in his stunning memoir of the same title, The Gap Between the World and Me. I suspect it can feel a lot like building a bridge to nowhere. But the thing to understand about a culture of racism is that not nobody gets out unscathed. Joseph Barnt at Crossroad Ministries likens White's experience of a culture of racism as one of being hermetically sealed by four walls. A wall of separation and isolation as a result of generations of segregation in housing a wall of illusions of our own innocence, 
and delusion about the magnitude of racial disparities, a wall of amnesia about history, and a limited capacity for experiencing others' pain. And finally, the fourth wall of power and privilege awarded us by our pigmentation. And that gives rise often to defensive postures. Barnes says, a culture of racism is one in which whites, and I quote him, lose our humanity, our authenticity, and our freedom. Unlike folks of color who have had these things taken from them by a culture of racism, whites have handed them over in order to become and remain white. Bart's assessment strikes a chord for me and maybe other whites in the room when I think about growing up as a white Catholic and as a product of Catholic schools and communities my entire life. I think that we are like disciples locked away in the upper room after the crucifixion. White Catholics in the U.S. are walled off from the reconciling joy of the resurrection because we haven't faced our collective complicity in the crucifixion of people of color in the U.S. We are paralyzed. Thank you. We are paralyzed by our unquestioned confidence in what we think we know about racism in the echo chamber of our white-only conversations or predominantly white academies and boardrooms, high schools and universities, churches and service teams. We're stuck in a mental space where we reject the need for healing out of fear of those we've harmed. We are hamstrung by our amnesia where the memory of Jesus' acts of love of neighbor and forgiveness of sinners is concerned. We're caught in the repetitive loop of history to which we respond at best with inequality sustaining charity. We are blinded by our own judgments about the people on the receiving end of our charity and hijacked by our self-righteous anger when they are not sufficiently grateful. We're burdened by gifts we don't even know we have and clueless as to how to contribute to movements of racial inclusion. We are choosing self-isolation in an all-white upper room of our own making rather than encountering the liberating mercy of the wounded and yet resurrected Christ in the people outside the door. Internalization of superiority naturally makes us, in the words of faith-based activist John Perkins, self-addicted. And self-addicted people cannot get out of our own ways. We are not bridges, we are roundabouts, going in circles with our guilt, our ignorance, and with our charity. In a recent address at the Synod of Bishops last month, the Pope helped me understand why the locked upper room of whiteness is so bad for our Catholic Church in the U.S., which, despite shifting demographics, remains a predominantly white institution when you think about the power structure. In one of his homilies, Francis said, a church with closed doors betrays herself and her mission, and instead of becoming a bridge, becomes a roadblock. So how do we hear, and I'm speaking directly to my fellow white brothers and sisters in the Ignatian family, how do we transform the roadblock of racism into a bridge of solidarity and perhaps adjusting our expectations a bit into footbridges within our own communities that might lead to effective bridges to other racial justice movements now underway. What would it take for banners like these also to hang on our stage here at the Teach-In? I'd like to recommend I'd like to recommend that we start to build those kinds of movements in our own home institutions, since we've spent some time acknowledging this morning that racism is just as present here in this room, back at our own home institutions, as it is out in the world. So let me offer you five pieces of homework, perhaps, to consider. Yes, homework. <laughs> 
First, let me recommend that you draw close to the pain of racism, perhaps using the word that seems to shape Pope Francis's papacy. Encounter the pain of racism on your service team, in your high school class, in your parish, in your own self, in order to release yourself from the upper room of fear of pain. Draw close to folks who have experienced racism and then just listen. Turn off the inner monologue and be present to others. I recognize that another big word for Francis and his papacy is dialogue, but white folks just need to be quiet and listen. If you can't draw close to the pain of racism in a person that you know, then read three books. The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. Between the World and Me by Tinehesi Coates. And Shape Shifters, Black Girls and the Choreography of Citizenship by Amy Cox at Fordham University. I'd also recommend that maybe you talk to Brendan Underwood. It sounds like he's also got a pretty nice reading list put together. Secondly, whoops, jumping the gun. Get some training. Get some training on what racism is, where it comes from, what we can do about it. This is absolutely critical for starting any kind of movement. You need a shared vocabulary, a sense of history, tools for doing the analysis of systems of white supremacy, and an inventory of the challenges and gifts you have in your own community. I'd suggest you talk to folks from Fordham about their experiences with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. They're here today. I'm sure they'll talk to you about their Undoing Racism Collective. Or reach out to Dr. Alex Mikulich in the Office of Mission at Loyola, New Orleans to learn about Pax Christie's approach to undoing racism. Again, talk to Brendan Underwood at St. Louis High School about the STARS program he's put together. But you need to get training. Third, Build an inclusive community of people in your branch of the Ignatian family who are willing to wade into some of these very deep waters. Be sure to pay attention to who's not among you and who's driving the bus. If there are not folks of color and folks of color in leadership roles in your community, then you might need to apply some of the training you received in step two in order to ask some good questions about why that is and what you might do about it. But you need an inclusive community. Step number four, and I think this, I, uh, this echoes in some ways what Cheryl Davis just talked to us about earlier, about building bridges with our bodies. Do something with your bodies. Prayer, brainstorm and prayer storm about something creative, something performative, something interruptive you can do with your body, particularly your white body, which is given far more privileges in our society than many of us even know. <laughs> do something individual. Do something collective, something that will make it difficult for people not to see the pain you are attempting to lift up, something that will make it difficult to see, the, to see that pain in the same way, something that will convert hearts to want to join you in the work to, to change structures in your community. And then finally, love the people in your community, including yourself with all of your flaws and your shortcomings and your mistakes, and especially the folks who have hurt you in the past, have some compassion for their own pain, and love the folks who disappoint you, and recognize that you will be the biggest disappointment to yourself. Love yourself anyway. Recognize that your ability to love each other in and of itself is what unmasks the lie of racism that says we cannot really trust each other, that we cannot really know each other, that our destinies are really not shared. 
Love is the thing that helps us to see that building multicultural communities is often messy, but it's always beautiful. And celebrate that beauty. Go to Eucharist, the dinner party of the Jesus movement, movement, the place that we can be transformed into wounded healers who remember the body of Christ, who put the body of Christ back together, the body of Christ that has been so torn apart by racism. So it is with the deepest love of this Ignatian family that I ask, if not now, then when? If not us, the Ignatian family, then who? And if not in our own communities, then where? Thank you. Thank you.